Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and ScyllaDB. My name is Cody J. Brown, I'm the host of TechStrong Learning. We have an exciting presentation ahead of us, but first, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. First, today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion, or you'd like to share it with a friend or rewatch, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live webinar. You should also receive an email shortly after we conclude with a link to access that recording. If you have any questions for Peter, we want you to submit those to the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen and to engage with your fellow audience members or let us know just where you are tuning in from, you can use the chat tab. We also have two polls near the beginning of today's webinar, so we want your participation there. And finally, at the conclusion of our webinar, we will be giving out four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around. Our webinar topic today is demystifying the distributed database landscape. And I'm joined today by Peter Corliss, Director of Technical Advocacy at ScyllaDB. Peter, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm going to give you the floor. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Cody. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I also want to let you know that we're going to have an up, another upcoming workshop, Getting Started with ScyllaDB. It will be held on April 28th, 2022, at the times you can see listed here. You can register at ScyllaDB.com slash webinars. Uh, before we begin, we're going to push a quick poll question. Where are you in your NoSQL adoption? I currently use ScyllaDB. I currently use Apache Cassandra. I currently use another NoSQL database. I'm currently evaluating NoSQL. I'm interested in learning more about ScyllaDB or none of the above. All right, thanks for those responses. I'm gonna get started, but you know, feel free to keep on answering the questions as I talk. So today, again, we're talking about demystifying the distributed database landscape. Uh, and I'll give you a survey of the technologies in use today, how they compare, and a bit of the shape of things to come in this next tech cycle. First off, a little about ScyllaDB. Uh, we're a monstrously fast and scalable NoSQL distributed database, perfect for highly available, highly performant terabyte scale workloads. It was patterned after Apache Cassandra, and it also offers an Amazon DynamoDB compatible API. Uh, and here's a quick snapshot of just some of the many companies using ScyllaDB. As you can see, it's not just one industry. Anyone looking to run a big, fast, always-on uh, distributed database can use us. You can start small and keep scaling. There's no barriers to hit as your company or your use cases grow. So who is this guy, you may be asking. My name is Peter Corliss. I am the Director of Technical Advocacy at ScyllaDB. What that means is I listen to our open source users and our enterprise customers learn from their experiences, and then I share their stories along with the voice of our own internal engineers, our product strategists. Uh, we'll share that with you and the rest of the growing community of interest. Uh, that can take many forms, blogs, case studies, or webinars like today. And if you have any questions or if you have a story of your own to share, you can find me at Twitter at Peter Corliss. My DMs are always open. First, I want to acknowledge uh, the creative chaos that you deal with daily. Uh, you're in the middle of what we at ScyllaDB have dubbed this next tech cycle. Everything is co-evolving from uh, cloud and on-premises platforms you run on to disparate systems that need to integrate. Uh, there's a mix of open and closed source software you need to standardize on. Even the languages and operating systems you work with, they're all co-evolving, plus all the methodologies you need to use day to day. So all of these familiar technologies, even our business models, are themselves undergoing revolutionary change. And we say this next tech cycle, it means it's happening right now. It's not the home of tomorrow. It's not the shape of things to come, it's today. And it's a wave that's carrying us forward from trends that got their start earlier this century. It's beyond big data. We're talking huge data. Welcome to the Zettabyte era. This era, depending upon who's defining it, either started in 2010 for total data stored on earth or in 2016 for total internet protocol traffic in a year. Now, individual data intensive corporations can be generating information at the rate of petabytes per day and storing exabytes in total. And there are some prognosticators who believe that we'll see humanity, our computing systems and our IoT enabled machinery generating a half a zettabyte of data per day by 2025. 
Yet conversely, we're also seeing the importance of small data. Take a look at the genomics revolution because the RNA sequence of say COVID-19 is actually not that big data wise, but it is increasingly important to understand every single bite of that information because vaccinating against a global pandemic requires understanding every change of that rapidly evolving pathogen. So it's everything between huge data and small data systems. And the database you need to use needs to align with the volume of data that you have under management. Also, this next tech cycle is not just the cloud computing cycle because AWS launched in 2006 and Google Cloud in 2008 and uh, Azure formally in 2010. So we're already half a decade past the dawn of the public cloud. Yet this next tech cycle builds upon the ecosystems, methodologies and technologies these hyperscalers provide. So once there were these three predominant cloud vendors, then you had to figure out how to cobble their services together. So in 2011, Red Hat had OpenShift, but this was resisted at first by the cloud vendors themselves, and it was hard to manage, really hard. So things began to shift in 2015 with the release of Kubernetes. It took a few years to get people on board, but by now, everyone has gravitated to this new standard for orchestration. So now a sea change is underway because in 2019, we had Anthos from Google Cloud, followed in 2020 by AWS announcing EKS Anywhere, um, and 2021, we had Azure Arc. And we'll talk more about those in a bit. So first off, is the database you use aligned with how and where you need to deploy it? Uh, was it designed in the on-premises era? Does its code base reflect that legacy? Does it only really work if you're running it behind your firewall uh, on a server that you have root access to? Or conversely, does it only work in the cloud, specifically on a single vendor's particular cloud? So these are really important questions. It's also not just broadband or wireless internet revolutions. We're two decades into both of those. Yet the advent of gigabit broadband and the diverse new range of 5G services um, are uh, enabling incredible new opportunities in real-time data streaming services, IoT, edge use cases, and more. Uh, and it took until about 2019 before one gigabit per second broadband was available for 86% of American households. And it's going to take time to scale up and build out to 10 gigabit per second uh, broadband services. We're already seeing three gigabit per second consumer services. So, but because of the work laying out fiber over the past decade, that ramp up is likely going to be easier. So how does your database work when you need to... Uh, to connect uh, to systems far and near? How important are the limitations of the speed of light to your latencies? How well do you deal with ingestion, um, data ingestion from hundreds of millions of endpoints at gigabit per second speeds? And finally, underpinning all of this are the raw capabilities of silicon, summed up by transistor and core counts of the current generation CPUs and what's soon to come. We've already reached 64 core CPUs and the next generation is gonna double that to a point where a single CPU will have more than 100 processors. Uh, fill a rack scale high performance computer with those and you can easily get to thousands of cores per server. And all of this is just traditional CPU based computing. So beyond this, you have GPU advancements and quantum computers um, that could reach a million qubits by 2029. So this next tech cycle is powered by all these fundamentally revolutionary capabilities. And it's what's enabling these real time full streaming data from anyone to anywhere, and this is just the infrastructure. If you dive deeper into the underlying hardware, you know that each of the architectural bottlenecks is undergoing its own revolution. So we've already seen CPU densities uh, growing on the public cloud. You can already get servers with over 400 vCPUs. Uh, also expect to see on-premise services with greater than 1,000 or even 2,000 cores. Yet vanilla CPUs themselves are also giving way to full systems on a chip or SOCs. Memory, another classic bottleneck, is getting a huge boost from DDR5 today and DDR6 in a few years. So densities are going up. You're going to uh, expect to see Warhorse systems with maybe a full terabyte of RAM. Just like the high-end uh, AWS I4I series that's soon to arrive, um, these and larger scale systems are going to be increasingly common and for businesses, increasingly affordable. Storage is also seeing its own revolution with the recently approved NVMe base and transport specifications, which are going to enable easier implementation of NVMe over fabrics. So now software will have to play catch up to these capabilities, just as it took time for kernels and then applications inside of a vertically scaled box to be made 
Async Everywhere, Sharded for Core, Numa Aware, this next tech cycle is going to require systems to adapt a whole new methodologies of getting the most from this new hardware. Also, if clustering is hard, we'll be talking a lot more about clustering, but if clustering is hard, then clustering across cloud environments is even harder. But more and more upper management directives are coming down to either be able to run across a hybrid on-premises and public cloud environment, or to be able to run across multiple public cloud environments. So just as we don't want to be locked into old ways of thinking and doing, the industry does not want to be locked into any one technology provider. Less than 10% of enterprises are satisfied with a single vendor lock-in scenario. So if you've just been mastering the art of running stateful distributed systems on a single cloud using Kubernetes, now you're being asked to do it all over again, only now in a hybrid or multi-cloud environment using Anthos, OpenShift, Tanzu, EKS Anywhere, Azure Arc, something like that. In terms of methodologies, just take a look at these from the dawn of the millennium onwards. As an industry, we've moved from batch operations and monolithic upgrades performed with multi-hour windows of downtime on the weekend to a world of streaming data and continuous software delivery performed 24 by 7 by 365 with zero downtime ever. And by adopting to the cloud and this always-on world, We've exposed ourselves and our organizations to a world of random chaos and security threats. Uh, we now have to operate fleets of servers autonomously and orchestrate them across on-premises, edge, and multiple cloud vendor environments. Uh, while Scrum has been around since the 1980s, continuous integration since 91, in this century, the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto in 2001 altered the very philosophy, never mind the methodologies underlying the way software was developed. And the Agile Manifesto's very first line talks about the highest priority being to satisfy the customer through continuous delivery of software. But that specific term, continuous delivery or CD, as we know it today, didn't really take a hold in 2009. It was then married at the hip to, to continuous integration, and it coincided with the birth of what we now know as DevOps, CICD. With that, you now had a framework for defining change-oriented processes and software life cycles through a responsive developer culture uh, that now, a decade or two into this revolution, everyone takes as a given. But onto this baseline of tools, systems, philosophies, um, we now have to extend these fundamental principles. Microservices architectures invented to deal with the world of cloud computing meant you had to break away from your monolithic applications. It supported this world of CI and CD by breaking the applications apart into multiple different systems. Then the chaos monkeys of the world arrived as well as pen testers and they wanna break into these systems. They wanna uncover flaws and defects long before something uh, happens catastrophically or maliciously to you. So cloud native technologies like Kubernetes and single source of truth for infrastructure methodologies like GitOps were created out of the sheer necessity to scale these systems to hundreds of thousands of production software deployments under management. And it's still not enough. I mean, we've already seen software supply attacks uh, like SolarWinds or low level system attacks like Spectre or Meltdown or Zombie Load or human factors threats like viral deep fakes or um, you know, generative adversarial networks uh, creating user accounts. Uh, never mind millions of IoT-enabled devices uh, being nefariously harnessed for distributed denial of service attacks. These are just the bow shocks of what's coming. So now your AI-powered security systems are locked in mortal combat every day in real time against the threat actors attempting to undermine your normal operations. And we know this is happening because a growing number of intrusion prevention and malware analysis systems are built at terabyte and beyond scale using distributed databases like SolidDB as their underlying storage engine. So now rather than just DevOps, we talk about DevSecOps because security cannot be an afterthought, not even for your MVP in 2022. And all of these methodologies are continuing to evolve. It's, it's like the movie title says, we're being asked to do everything, everywhere, all at once. And everyone is finding their own personal battles to prevent our own doomsdays of downtime. So all of this is just the context upon which you, as a technology pro professional, is trying to make a decision. 
what database will be able to keep up with this crazy onslaught of scale, adaptability, ease of use, performance, and security in your environment. And in a way, your decision-making has to be prophetic. You need to make a choice now that's going to stand the test of time, or at least until you get a decent ROI and not cause your business to melt. So with all this in mind, as our overall technology Weltanschauung, right, we can finally get into the analysis of the distributed database landscape itself. So but before I go into the next section, I just want to take a moment for a quick audience poll. For a sense of scale, I'd like to understand how much data do you have under management in your own transactional database systems? So please pick the answer that best matches your current data set. And we're going to leave this poll up a bit for you to answer. Also remember to use that Q&A feature to ask your questions at any time. I'll answer them all at the end. Thanks. So we've talked about this overall milieu that we're operating in, the zeitgeist. Now let's narrow our focus down to how this specifically is impacting distributed databases. You've likely seen listicles like this all over the web, the different database types, uh, the places you can deploy databases, the licensing, service models. And I apologize, I only have an hour here today, so I'm going to narrow down from hundreds of choices to just a few exemplars. So I'm going to ask, is anybody else a fan of DB Engines like I am? Because for anyone who's never visited the site, it's the billboard charts of databases. It keeps a rough popularity index of all the databases you can imagine, 391 systems as of today. But let's just take a look at the top of the charts. What constitutes the top 100 on dbengines.com? Nearly half of those systems are SQL. About a quarter are NoSQL. Only one in nine are what's known as multi-model, which can mean anything from supporting various NoSQL data models, such as wide column and graph, to those that support both SQL and NoSQL. So a handful are also then search engines or in time series databases or systems are just hard to categorize in any uh, typical way. So all of these database choices, I'm going to, um, of all the database choices I'm going to delve into, we're just going to choose a few of these. Again, just like we just had to narrow down, we're going to narrow down again out of the top 100. We're going to take a look for maybe the top five. So are all of the top 100 databases distributed databases? For some, we can clearly say yes. For others, we can clearly say no. But for many, it really depends upon what you mean when you say a distributed database. So I wanted to define some attributes of what we should consider as a distributed database. As you know, SQL is formally standardized uh, as ANSI or ISO 9075 2016. It hasn't changed in six years. But what has changed over that same six years is how people have architected distributed RDBMSs uh, that are now known as new SQL, like CockroachDB. Um, conversely, there is no ANSO or ISO, ANSI or ISO, there's no IETF, there's no W3 definition of what a NoSQL database is. Each is proprietary, or at least it uses a, a de facto standard like Cassandra query language or CQL uh, that's used for wide. A uh, column NoSQL database, There's about a half a dozen of them standardized upon that. There's also the gremlin slash tinkerpop query methods for graph databases. But those are just query protocols, CQL, uh, uh, SQL, all of these are query protocols. They don't define how the data gets distributed across the databases. And these are architectural issues that the query languages don't and won't address. So I took time to write up my own definition of what a distributed database is. And I'll freely admit, it's more of a layman's pragmatic view than a computer science professor's. So in brief, you have to decide how you define a cluster and how you distribute database across it. Next, you have to determine what roles each of the nodes in the cluster are. And every node uh, may have a peer, or some nodes may be more uh, superior in a leader position, and others are more followers. And then based on these roles, how do you deal with failover? Last, you have to figure out, based on this, how you replicate and shard your data as evenly and easily as possible. So with this in mind, I went into the top 100, and I found five examples to see how they compare when measured against those attributes. So I've chosen two SQL and three NoSQL systems, Postgres and Cockroach, representing the best of distributed and new SQL, and then Mongo, Redis, and SillaDB as distributed NoSQL, Mongo being key value, uh, sorry, document, Redis is key value, and silly B, like I said, wide column. 
Um, also note that for uh, what I say is true of SillyDB is in many cases also true of Apache Cassandra or any of the other Cassandra compatible systems. So I apologize if uh, your favorite system wasn't selected, but I want you to keep in mind uh, how we're comparing them and then think about how that implies to your own favorite database. Um, and also I apologize if anybody has any corrections for anything I say here, please put that in the Q&A and I'll make sure to update my slides for any future iterations. Um, and I'm also, uh, for now, I'm going to presume that all of us here in the year 2022 have taken the prerequisite readings of what is SQL versus NoSQL, but just in case there uh, is a link there, um, and otherwise we'll presume that you haven't been uh, frozen in a block of ice for the past decade. So let's dive into clustering. If you've listened to SillyDB's um, CTO, or uh, Avi Kaviti, he'd argue that a single modern multi-core, multi-CPU node already constitutes its own network. It's already a distributed database, a cluster of compute elements even inside the node. But we're not gonna explore that path for today. For today, for the sake of this argument, we'll define a node as a single computational whole, whether that node is a virtual instance or a physical server running your database. When the industry began, you had one giant node, often a mainframe, or by the 1980s, it might even be a desktop computer, but it was considered one thing. But now, um, even now, like there's modern monolithic vertically scaled databases and you don't really run them in a distributed fashion. You have a single system and at best, what you may have is a hot standby for disaster recovery. The standby is passively replicating the main server, but it's only gonna take over in case of systemic failure. Um, the hot standby is not really taking any of the normal load. It's just sitting there idly humming in case of an emergency. So we'll have to define a cluster as comprised of nodes that are actively handling user traffic simultaneously. So in this way, that hot standby doesn't count. It's just there as a contingency. And thus a distributed database needs to be running on a cluster of N active nodes where N is greater than one. The first way to create that distributed cluster is with local clustering. This is needed when you want to keep latencies as low as possible, such as if you're running an in-memory cache or data store that needs sub-millisecond latencies. Doing a distributed database across data centers, you'd get killed by the speed of light propagation delays that you can run into. They can run to 100 milliseconds or more. Or perhaps you're running a fully ASIC-compliant, strong consistency transaction in an RDBMS and you wanna run in a single data center because otherwise you'd have locking and blocking and you'd, have, you'd be hitting timeouts and retries if you needed to wait for round trip times to all your global data centers. So in both cases, either an in-memory data store or a strong consistent RDBMS, local clustering allows for basic data distribution without busting your SLAs. Now with local clustering, if you're rack aware, you can also ensure that none of the servers are in the same data center rack and that minimizes outages if power or connectivity is lost to one rack or another, and that's the barest bones form of topology awareness you'd want. Some databases do better than this and allow for multiple copies of the database to be running in different data centers with some sort of cross cluster updating mechanism. So each of them is running autonomously and their synchronization mechanism could be unidirectional, one data center just updating a downstream replica, or they could be bidirectional or multidirectional. So this geographic distribution minimizes latencies by allowing connections closer to the users. Um, spanning the database across availability zones or regions ensures that there's no single uh, data center disaster that could mean that you lose part of all of your data. So, um, but if they aren't really one logical cluster, queries could return different results based upon which cluster you connect to and your synchronization delay. For example, that's how DNS or Active Directory works. Each system works on its own and there is a propagation delay uh, of updates between the systems. So you, you could even take a day or two for a DNS update to propagate around the world. So to ensure strong consistency, you'd want full multi-data center clustering. Here, all the different sites are considered one logical whole. You still have to face issues of strong or eventual consistency and the database design should ideally match your use case um, and you know, maybe provide you some flexibility at the level of consistency you want, but now the propagation delay in updates might be sub-second even across the globe. 
So let's see how our options um, compare in terms of clustering. Now, all of them are capable of clustering and even multi-data center uh, operations. But in the case of Postgres, MongoDB, and Redis, these designs had predated multi-data center design as an architectural requirement. They were designed in the world of a single data center clustering architecture to begin with. So Postgres, in fact, uh, it was first released in, what, 1986, so it predates the concept of cloud computing. Uh, but over time, it evolved to allow for these advances and capabilities to be bolted onto its design. Whereas CockroachDB, uh, part of the new SQL revolution, was designed from the ground up with global distribution in mind. MongoDB, uh, released at the dawn of the public cloud, was initially designed with single data center clustering in mind, but now has added support for quite a lot of different topologies. And with MongoDB Atlas, you can deploy to multiple regions pretty easily. Redis, because of its low latency design assumptions, it's designed generally deployed on a single data center, but it has enterprise features that allow for multi-data center deployments. And SildaDB, like Cassandra, was designed with multi-data center deployments in mind from the get-go. It's available in the open source um, uh, releases. So now you have the database uh, engine running across these different multiple nodes. So what do you do with your data? Do you split it as evenly as possible between the different nodes? That's known as sharding. Or do you keep full copies on each of the nodes? And that's called replication and fully replicated at that. You can even combine those methods. So you can have a sharded database that also has multiple replicas of each shard. So for horizontal scalability, how does your system decide to shard your data? At first, that was always a manual process. I don't know if you guys remember that pain, but imagine a database that was just sharded alphabetically by the first letter of a surname. So you'd have A on one server, B on the next, C on the next. Um, those servers would be hit far more likely and they'd be become hot shards as opposed to, let's say, letters Q and X and Z if it was a surname, right? So distributed databases then started implementing algorithms to automatically shard your data across your nodes, balancing them as best as possible. So although auto sharding is more prevalent these days, there's still some distributed databases that haven't quite solved for how to specifically to auto shard, or um, they, make an auto, uh, they make auto sharding an advanced feature you don't get out of the box. So how you do replication and sharding is also dependent upon how hierarchical or homogenous your database architecture is. For example, in MongoDB, there's a single primary server and the rest are replicas of that primary. That's referred to as a replica set. So you can only really make writes to your primary copy of the database. The replicas are read-only, so you can't update them directly. Instead, you write to the primary, and it updates to the replicas. This helps distribute traffic in a read-heavy workload, but in a mixed or write-heavy workload, it's not really doing much good at all. The primary can become a bottleneck. As well, what happens when the primary goes down? You'll have to hold up writes entirely into the cluster like a new primary, and write operations can shunt over to the new primary. It's uh, it's a concerning single point of failure. Instead, if you look at SildaDB or Cassandra or any of the other leaderless peer-to-peer -peer systems, these are known as active-active because clients can read from or write to any node. There's no single point of failure, and each node will then update any other replicas of the data in the cluster. So if you have a replication factor of three and three nodes, each node will get an update based upon any writes to the other two nodes. Active-active uh, active is inherently more difficult to do computationally, but once you solve for how the servers keep each other in sync, you end up with, a, a, with systems that can load balance mixed or write heavy workloads far better because each node can serve reads or writes. Also, even if you have a distributed database, that doesn't mean your clients are aware of the topology. So people can either implement load balancing to front end your distributed database, or they can implement intelligent client-side load balancing that will route queries to the exact right nodes. So in SillaDB, our clients are not just um, token aware to get to the right node, but they're shard aware to direct queries to the exact right CPU core assigned to handle that particular data. So CockroachDB and SillaDB and Cassandra all have that active-active design in mind, whereas Postgres, there's a few optional ways you can do it, but it's not built in. Also, Active Active is not officially supported in Mongo, but there have been some stabs to how to do it. And with Redis, an Active Active model is possible with conflict free replicated data types, CRDTs, in Redis Enterprise. Otherwise, Postgres, MongoDB, and Redis all default to primary replica data distribution models. Distributed systems designs also affect how you might distribute data across different racks and data centers you've deployed to. 
Um, so given a primary replica system, only data center one, in this case, can serve any write workloads. Data center two only serves as a read-only copy. In a peer-to-peer -peer system that supports multi-data data center clustering, each node in the overall cluster can accept reads or writes, and that allows for better geographic workload distribution. With SciliaDB, you can even, for example, uh, have a different replication factor per site. Uh, so here I've shown the possibility of having three replicators of data in one data center and two replicas in another. Um, so operations can then have different levels of consistency. Um, so again, these are uh, considerations you have as to, as to how to do this. So with Cockroach and SciliaDB, that comes built in. Topology awareness is, was also part of MongoDB, I think starting in 2015. So not since its launch in 2009, but certainly they have years of experience with it. Postgres and Redis were originally designed to be single data center solutions. As I described, dealing with multi-data center latencies are sort of an anti-pattern for both. So you can add on topology awareness, like you can add on active active system features, but it doesn't come out of the box. So let's review these by taking a look at the databases individually. Postgres is one of the most popular implementations of SQL these days. It offers local clustering out of the box. However, Postgres, as far as I know, is still working on its cross data center and cross, uh, sorry, multi data center and cross cluster clustering. So you may have to put some effort into getting it working. Uh, because SQL is grounded in strongly consistent transact in a transactional mindset, it doesn't lend itself well to spanning a cluster across a wide geography. Each query could be held up by the longest latency delays between all other relevant data centers. Uh, and again, Postgres normally relies upon this primary replica model. Um, and finally, sharding in Postgres still remains manual for the most part, though they're making advances in developing auto sharding, which are again beyond the base offering. Cockroach again builds itself as new SQL, a SQL database designed in mind for distribution. And so this is a SQL designed to be survivable, hence the name, right? So note that CockroachDB uses the same Postgres wire protocol and it borrows heavily from many of the same concepts pioneered in Postgres, but it doesn't limit itself to the Postgres architecture. Multi-data center clustering, peer-to-peer -peer leaders topology, it's built in from the get-go. So it's auto sharding and data replication, and it's got data center awareness built in, so you can add radical, rack awareness too. Uh, the only caveat to CockroachDB, and you may see it as a strength or a weakness, is that it requires strong consistencies on all its transactions. You don't have the flexibility of eventual consistency nor tunable consistency, which will lower throughput and require a higher baseline latency in any cross data center deployment. MongoDB, again, is the venerable leader of the NoSQL pack. So over time, it developed a lot of distributed database capabilities that were added to its base offering. It's come a long way from its origins. So now MongoDB is capable of multi-data center clustering. It still follows a primary replica model for the most part, but there are ways to make it peer-to-peer active-active. Next up is Redis, key value store designed as an in-memory cache or data store. While it can persist data, it suffers from a huge performance penalty if the data set doesn't really fit into RAM. So because of that, it was designed with local clustering in mind because if you can't afford to wait five milliseconds to get data off an SSD, you probably can't wait 145 milliseconds to make the network ground trip from San Francisco to London. However, there are enterprise features, like I said, that do allow multi-data center Redis clusters for those who need geographic distribution. Again, Redis operates for the most part as a primary replica model, which is appropriate for a read-heavy caching server. But what it means is that the primary is where the data needs to get written to first, which will then fan out to the replicas to help balance their caching load. So again, there's an enterprise feature to allow for peer-to-peer active-active -active clusters. So Redis does auto shard and it replicates data, um, but a topology awareness is I think limited to rack awareness as an enterprise feature. I finally went to SciliaDB. It was patterned after the distributed database model found in Apache Cassandra. And so it comes by default with multi-data center clustering, leaderless active-active -active topology. It automatically shards. It has tunable consistency per operation. And if you want stronger consistency, it even supports lightweight transactions that provide linearizability per write. So as far as topology awareness, SciliaDB, of course, supports rack awareness and data center awareness. It even supports token awareness and shard awareness. Like I said, to know not only which node to go to, but even down to which CPU core is associated with that data. 
So it's all the goodness you're looking for from a distributed database. Now, that's only five of the top 100 databases. So while Captain America can go on all day, um, let's, for now, let's move on. Let's take a look at where distributed databases, oh, so we've looked at where they are today. Now let's take a look at the specific trends that are shaping the way distributed databases are evolving. So actually, before we go forward with where we're moving towards, I want to say something about the trends in terms we're moving away from, in specific, the acronym S. SQL. This Google trend on the bottom shows the volume of searches on the term SQL itself are down 78% from the year 2004 when Google Trends began. And the Google Ngram viewer on the top is tracking book citations for SQL all the way back to the year the term was coined. So you can see that those declined 72% from the technology's peak in print in the year 2008, just before the dawn of the NoSQL revolution, and back when people still read books. <laughs> so the very term SQL, which is still predominant in the industry mindshare, has dramatically eroded. And by the way, it's not like the term is being replaced by anything in particular. If you were to graph NoSQL or NewSQL, they would have essentially be a little bit more than flat lines across the x-axis. So it really begs the question, what are we moving towards? So what we're seeing is a continuing Cambrian explosion of databases and database-like systems. There's been a blurring or blending of what a database actually is and how it may fit into other technologies. For example, a streaming system like Confluent Kafka, um, which has touted KSQL for years, is that a database, right? Or think about the hybrid systems occurring with distributed ledgers, whether blockchains or directed acyclic graphs or so on. Because I know for sure that there's a couple of these technologies that use SillyDB in their architecture, like IOTA or Uniris. Um, Big Chain DB is built on MongoDB. There are people doing similar work with Postgres. There's a lot of blending going on, and expect more of it. Uh, in fact, don't expect consolidation in the market like we've seen, say, with all the major cloud providers standardizing on Kubernetes as a de facto orchestra uh, orchestration mechanism, or they've all decided that Linux was the de facto operating system. Instead, this will be more like the programming language market, which continues to evolve. New languages, new methods within each language, look forward to a continued fragmentation in the data storage world. And lastly, I wanna say that while the term SQL itself is fading, the concepts that are so strongly and closely associated with it are making their way into the NoSQL database world. Acid transactions, strong consistency, schema constraints, strict typing, and so on. So just like NoSQL, which doesn't have a set definition, cloud native can mean many things to many people. It's spongy, fuzzy, you can even call it elastic. In fact, let's talk about elasticity. Um, if you need to provision more capacity for a lunchtime crowd or the evening commute or for a stochastic event you had no way to predict, you can't wait for six hours for the database to reshard and rebalance in the background. Lunchtime's over by then. The stochastic event you needed to hop on top of in real time has already passed you by. So, and I'm not going to lie, this is a hard problem to solve for. Scaling a distributed stateful service and databases at terabyte to petabyte scale isn't going to simply happen with the flipping of the switch ease. Um, even hyperscalers like Amazon DynamoDB have rate limits as to how quickly you can add capacity or remove it once the peak is passed. So serverless is also a key in, uh, interest these days. People are getting used to seeing a database as a service, not as a daemon running in a hardware cluster you have to install, configure, and manage. You, developers just want an API they can connect to, and no, please don't ask them to become a DBA or a sysadmin. Um, so another thing that we're seeing is this uncoupling of compute from storage. Uh, and it's a growing trend for a couple of reasons. The first is tiered storage, where you may want some data stored on fast, low latency media, whether that's persistent memory being used as storage or NVMe SSDs versus block storage or even spinning HDDs. For example, this is what can be done for data that's not quite current but hasn't reached its expiration date yet. Uh, the reason for this is TCO. So you can save by not keeping all your data in the most expensive media or performance in case you want to keep some of your most active data in a faster storage medium. Tiered storage has architectural difficulties, though. 
you have to, uh, the issue of impotence mismatch, right? The whole database can essentially seize up waiting for the slowest media if you haven't designed your queries or partitioning, uh, data partitioning well. So just imagine the nightmare of a full table scan against HDDs. Plus, a lot of systems currently rely upon homogeneity of nodes. And so thus, tiered storage can be an anti-pattern to their very design. Another uncoupling in distributed databases is plug-in storage. For example, Janus Graph is an open source Gremlin Tinkerpop graph database. It can use SillyDB as a plug-in storage layer, or it could use Cassandra or HPACE or a variety of other NoSQL databases. So expect to see more of that where the storage engine itself can be swapped out while the user query language, the operational commands and configurations, all of that remains the same from the app developer and the DevOps perspective. The next trend I call data over time. As I've said, we're moving from this batch-oriented thinking to streaming data. And so what database can really avoid time series data in the coming decade? Like what database can comfortably ignore the event streaming revolution? Um, aren't we all going to have to consider how we handle data over time in that regard? So point in time and bounded time frame queries, historical trend analysis, triggers, alarms, real-time events. Um, well, sure, there are many data sets that are relatively static. This just screams at me as an emerging consideration for everyone designing and operating databases solving real-time problems. The next is what I call data over space. I talked about rack and data center awareness, but that doesn't consider the actual physical topology uh, and in the data itself, there are standards for geospatial queries and geoindexing, geojson, and so on. They aren't universally implemented or implemented in the same, in the same across systems. So, and simple latitude and longitude, while that's pretty common today, beyond that, think of vehicular IoT, where you may need to support data and elements for altitude or attitude, roll, pitch, yaw, speed, acceleration, bearing. So... Again, these are spatial considerations that most people, you know, uh, unless they're in that space, haven't been thinking about. Next, there are geographic requirements associated with jurisdictional or political boundaries for the storage systems themselves. Can my data in server A be distributed to server B? Or more granularly, which tables, records, rows, columns, or even specific data cells can be shared or need to be masked across geographic boundaries? So, and even if I can share from jurisdiction A to jurisdiction B, can B then pass along to jurisdiction C? There's a lot of policy-based rules that need, to be, uh, that need to be implemented for cross data center replication. And yes, some database vendors are already offering this kind of ability, this kind of a capability, but expect a lot more of it to come. Uh, okay, so let's change some perspective now. Rather than what a database is or does, Let's reframe the question as to what a distributed database enables a developer to do with it. Traditionally, databases have been a place where you wrote queries and you got results. In this day and age, the database is a development platform where you're accessing APIs and upon which you're building full-blown apps. So if databases are to be useful, they have to be accessible, they have to be flexible. I can't think of an organization that did this better than MongoDB. They focus squarely on the needs of the developer community to win the hearts and minds of the developer generation. So you can argue whether all you want, whether MongoDB is a good or a bad database, but nearly 400,000 Twitter followers and over 21,000 GitHub stars means that they have objectively succeeding in attracting developers to their community. Uh, they put everything at the developer's fingertips. They center on their needs, desires, and whims first. Subsequently, you have plugins and APIs for MongoDB for just about anything you can imagine, from blockchain to Minecraft. And they're not alone in the industry. There are plenty of Postgres extensions and Redis modules. Rather than forking an entire project just to add your desired feature, there are methods now to hook in your logic and extend a database's basic capabilities. Boom, that's a game changer, right? So this next trend, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm personally interested in watching Evolve. With the NoSQL revolution, you had an explosion of query languages, grammars, operations, input, output formats, encapsulations, transport, so on. But now there are attempts, however tentative or halting, to adopt cross-system methodologies for making queries and returning results beyond just a REST API. 
the abs um, this abstracts the database from how developers perceive it, whether this is GraphQL or OpenAPI or any of a myriad of other attempts to hide the database internals and create microservices and API gateways. The next trend I see is an attempt to integrate AI and or ML directly into a database, whether that means predicate pushdowns from Apache Spark or uh, building ML engines inside the database itself, like Amazon Redshift ML, uh, BigQuery ML, or and so on. Such logic goes beyond just simple user-defined functions. It means your database can become or better integrate with your data pl processing platform. As Martin Heller said, be close to your data, and it makes sense. It's already happening and expect more of that to prolifer uh, proliferate across the industry. Uh, one salient issue uh, with this, I will point out, is that if you have to ensure that there's some sort of, you, you have to ensure there's some sort of computational guardrails on your system. Um, otherwise, your distributed database could uh, turn into a mad science experiment uh, that could bring your server to its knees. So, for instance, on SiliDB, we have what we call workload prioritization, so that transactions might be allowed to operate nonstop, and that unbounded query might be throttled to take longer, but it won't bring down your whole system. So speaking of uh, all these trends, uh, Jesse Anderson wrote the book on the concept called Data Teams, where you're bringing together your data engineers, your data scientists, and your operations teams together. So remember how I talked about DevSecOps? To enable that in practice, you need a diverse set of skills and talents. So as I see it, right now you have some organizations, one, one part of their brain in the hands of the CPU people and another part of their brain in the hands of the GPU people. Um, you know, some thinking transactions, some thinking analytics, some thinking about machine learning. And I think that while we make great strides, there's still more room uh, to bring these folks together more cohesively. Uh, and the next point is one that a company uh, like Amuta will raise. If the agile methodology was focused on delivering software to users, shouldn't there be an analog for data teams? In other words, rather than think about just creating data pipelines, a very supply side thing of how we produce data, shouldn't we also be thinking about data supply chains, considering all the disparate sources that our users need to draw from to obtain their results? It's more of a data consumer oriented vision. So, you know, I'd love to hear if you've had similar thoughts yourself. What all of this kind of thinking leads to is that you have to make your distributed database systems easier uh, all around, easier to obtain and consume, easier to sustain and to manage, easier to use and observe, easier to integrate into your existing ecosystems and your production environment. From the operation side though, this leads to two very different forms of easy. The first is making everything fully managed, cloud hosted. You don't have to worry about backups or upgrades or monitoring for downtime, all that's off your plate. You just develop your app. Phew, that's easy, but it usually comes at a price measured in dollars. The second way of making it easy is the open source method. You just download it for free. You can run the same software in your laptop, in Docker, in a Dockerized environment that you can then deploy uh, in a, to a thousand nodes in production. It's easy to obtain. Uh, you don't even need a credit card, but it also means that you have a higher level uh, that's required in education and knowledge and skill set, and all that equates to a price paid in time spent. So, of course, both are kinds of easy um, that are appropriate for different constituencies. SillyDB, for example, offers both SillyDB Cloud and SillyDB Open Source. Yet, many other distributed databases are only available as a service, while others are only available as a self managed open source. So, they're easy until they're not. Um, further, I believe that both kinds of easy, as they exist today, can be made even easier in the future by abstracting complexities, putting them behind great UI and UX, and a great developer experience. So thanks for joining me on this journey across the distributed database landscape. For those of you for whom this is familiar terrain, I hope you found some fresh, press, <laughs> fresh perspective on the changes occurring all around you. For those of you for whom this was a first foray into this landscape, I hope you return. Uh, if you'd like to continue your exploration beyond today, I highly encourage you to join our SillaDB users community in Slack if you haven't done so already. We have thousands of like-minded folks who are far more knowledgeable um, 
and, and their day-to-day -day practitioners, incredibly talented developers than I could ever hope to be. Speaking about knowledgeable people, I wanted to thank just a few individuals who provided me with some perspectives of their own on the state of distributed databases, uh, SillaDB's Kostya Ozapov and Oracle's Serge Leontiev. Uh, and repeating my disclaimer, if there's anything I got wrong with my talk, that's on me. All I'd ask is to kindly send me corrections afterwards so that I can keep on learning and improving. So um, let's see. I think we already did this poll, didn't we? I think we already did this poll, right? We sure did. Yeah, okay. So we just had an extra slide in here, folks. Don't worry about it. But I will be looking at your answers after the, uh, the thing. So for that, let's open it up to questions and answers. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And uh, what do we have in terms of questions here? What about ACID? You mentioned the evolution of big data, but won't consistency determinism be as much of a problem at scale as performance is? When will NoSQL be ACID compliant? Can it be? And the answer is yes. There are, I think, Foundation DB, isn't it? Um, um, there's a couple of different databases that are offering uh, ACID compliance. And it also depends upon what you mean by ACID. Technically, if you take a look at lightweight transactions in Scylla DB, they are ACID compliant so long as you're talking about a single partition update. So, um, but if you're talking about, let's say, a multi-partition update, then no, we are not ACID compliant. So, um, but yes, ACID is very important for a lot of people. But again, this is a trade-off. Do you want to have, like, let me go back to blockchain. Blockchain is strongly consistent, right? But that has a very limiting factor the larger a blockchain grows. And so now you have blockchains that can only do dozens of transactions per second. Let me repeat that dozens of transactions per second. Whereas for a SQL database, you might be looking for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. And for NoSQL, I know a lot of NoSQL databases can easily do a million transactions per second. So a lot of this depends upon what throughput are you looking for? Because this is, this is the decision that you should be making for the kind of data that you're handling. Um, is it where you literally cannot drop a byte? This is life or death stuff, and it must be... A, totally strongly consistent. Or is this the kind of thing like we, uh, there's another database I know, uh, which is a mapping database and they keep a consistency level of one. And if they're not the most recent copy, they don't care because you know they're constantly getting map tiles pushed to them from satellite systems that'll be changing every couple of hours or days anyway. So again, choose the consistency level and choose, you know again, this level of acid that meets the kinds of transactional requirements that you have. But yes, there are some NoSQL databases that are truly ACID compliant right now. Uh, and you know, again, I, if that's a requirement for you, I'm not gonna say no. Same thing for joins. I'm gonna say this too. If you need a table with joins, look for SQL. NoSQL, we're not, we're not here to argue whether SQL versus NoSQL, right? There's use cases for both, right? Um, and right now, if you take a look, again, like I said, about half these databases are, are SQL and about a quarter are NoSQL. So, you know, again, I think that what people are more interested in is how do I propagate data across them all? So now you're taking a look at tools that would manage your data schemas across systems, right? Uh, and to make sure that they stay orchestrated uh, appropriately, that you have, a, um, uh, let's say, a, a meta map of all your different data uh, systems. Obviously, this is very important when you might be going from, let's say, an RBMS to Kafka, that Kafka data is gonna be pumped into Scylla. Scylla might need to push it out to a different system, take that data back from another Kafka topic, do some more enrichment, and then push it downstream to yet another system. That's what we're seeing these days. It's not so much a stack anymore. It's this data flow that has all sorts of uh, different elements of it. So, you know, again, um, in that kind of system, you have the issue of here's an RDBMS, which might be ACID compliant, but it's flowing to a, a, a non-ACID compliant, maybe a NoSQL system, right? And then eventually its end destination might be another RDBMS, which may again be ACID compliant. But, but really think about like, what is, the, what is the true requirements of this data? Do, you know, can I tolerate eventual consistency? And if so, how do I want to tune that? Do I want it to be a local quorum so that, let's say, my data center in the East Coast 
that could be um, that could have a quorum consistency just amongst the cluster in the East Coast. There may be a separate cluster in the West Coast. Um, maybe sometimes you need to make sure that the quorum is not just local for high available, or uh, I should say, um, yeah, high availability in that local zone. But maybe you might want to do a cluster-wide quorum consistency for various reasons to make sure that you know you're again you're getting this kind of global consistency of data, and then each of those local clusters will eventually converge. All of this, again, I think people need to think back, what's the data I need to produce? What's the way I need to partition that data? And how do I need to query that data? And again, it's very opposite from people's mindsets when they came from, you know, how do I structure a table? And then how do I join my tables? Hey, right? this is how we all got started. Uh, you know, I'm gonna structure a table, I'm gonna make joins, and eventually, finally, I'm gonna think about the queries that I'm gonna run against this. Here, you know, again, with a lot of these systems, you need to think about what is the data I need to produce, and then what's the data structure I need to produce that? How do I distribute that? So I think it's very different than just the basic ACID kinds of stuff. Um, let's see. I think that that is that the only question we have then? That looks to be the case. All right. Well, I do want to thank everybody. And again, uh, if you'd like to join our next virtual workshop, we're at sillydb.com slash webinars. If you would like to learn more about SillaDB in particular, you can also go to um, Scylla University. That's university.sillaDB.com. Uh, and of course, you can always join us on Slack. And if you have any more questions, you can always hit me up on Twitter. Thanks very much. Great. And Peter, thank you so much for being here with me and for sharing your expertise with us. I know that was an action-packed 56 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And I want to thank the audience for attending. It was great. Um, on that note, I'd like to remind the audience that this session was recorded. So if you missed any of this discussion, maybe you joined us late, or maybe you were unfortunate and had to leave us early, you can rewatch. The recording will be living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars, and be sure to look in the on-demand section. We do have four gift cards to give away. Our first winner is Lauren D., our second winner is RJM. Our third winner is Anthony R. And our fourth and final winner is Shizoke M. So to the four of you, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim your gift card. And if you don't receive an email, just check your spam folder. I would like to thank Scylla for sponsoring today's webinar. We couldn't have done it without them. And to our audience, thank you so much for being here for the entirety of today's presentation. We ask that you just spend one more moment with us for a post-webinar survey that should pop up on your screen here in just a moment. But otherwise, we do hope to see you at a future Tech Strong Learning webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day. And Peter, again, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. And thank you so much for hosting.